last week saw the announcement of the nominees for this year's Academy Awards. Wait, wait, stop, stop, don't leave. This isn't another, hey, let's take a look at who made the list thing. I promise. But even if it was, hey, come on, guys, you already clicked on the video. You might as well at least watch it so you can have some specific things to cite when you jump down into the forums to declare how excited you are to not watch it because you don't need Hollywood telling you what the best movie was as though anyone has ever thought or suggested that that was the whole bloody point of these things. Anyway, since it is Oscar season, I figured this was as good a time as any to do some venting about a trend that's been annoying me as a film goer and a film critic for far too long. Namely, that I am sick and tired of movie studios using the Oscars as a promotional strategy instead of an awards show. And I'm even more sick and tired of the sorry state of the movie industry that's led to them doing so in the first place. And, eh, you know what, maybe I should back up a bit. Question. You ever wonder why it is that so many movies that get nominated for Best Picture are movies you've never heard of until they got nominated for Best Picture? Well, funny story. If you've been watching the show for a while, you're probably familiar with the idea that the movie releases tend to have seasons. This has been true pretty much since the dawn of the modern blockbuster era, when Hollywood realized that American teenagers and children had disposable incomes of their own, and that releasing big movies aimed at those audiences during summer vacations yielded big profits. Summer became blockbuster season, while winter became, for lack of a better word, old people movie season. Season. The effect of this on the Oscars and other awards shows was that instead of being spread out over a whole year, the kind of quote-unquote serious movies that tended to be nominated for and win awards started to pile up in the limited space between September and December, meaning that fewer people had time or opportunity to see them before it was time to start handing out the prizes, thus contributing to a perception that the Oscars had become detached from the input or experience of the average moviegoer. This perception, in turn, served to widen the legitimate gap between the tastes of mainstream audiences and the tastes of Oscar voters and other more devoted film fans, which in turn led to more and more niche Oscar winners and a new financial paradigm for the movie studios. If your movie had only just come out when the Oscar nominations, hell, even the actual winners were announced, they'd get a big publicity boost and maybe sell more tickets. So if you had a movie that you thought might be an Oscar nominee, it became a good business move to wait until the last possible minute to release it to the general public. Especially since the general public doesn't have to have seen a movie for it to qualify for a nomination. No, really. In fact, the only qualifications relating to release that a movie has to meet in order to be considered for an Oscar are these. It has to play for at least one week in at least one location in Los Angeles County, California at some point before midnight on December 31st of the year in question. Really, that's it. One week, one theater, one city, with the only cutoff being the end of the damn year. Now, theoretically, that should be a good thing, in that it levels the playing field by giving small or independently produced movies that can only maybe afford to play for that so-called qualifying run the same shot at a nomination as a huge studio movie that opened all over the world. Except that since professional Oscar collectors like Harvey Weinstein have the late release, earn nominations, reap profits game all worked out, those smaller movies still don't have much of a chance because the ranks are all clogged up with big star, big studio movies that are pretending to be indies with a limited release schedule. The end result of this is that huge chunks of the year are a wasteland for one type of movie or another. If you feel like seeing something other than a PG-13 action movie based on an old cartoon or comic book in the summer, you are out of luck. If you want to see something other than an oscar baity drama in the winter, you're also out of luck. And the movies end up suffering as well. How can any serious Oscar-caliber movie hope to stand out from the pack when they all get shoved out within weeks of each other? Now, granted, I'm still going to watch the show, since, you know, it's kind of my job, and I'm halfway looking forward to the months of grumpiness I'll be marinating in if they really do give best picture to the f***ing artist. But I really do think they need to change the way they do business, and not just for the Oscars. There's a lot of weird little ticks and outdated traditions and thought processes in the industry that are contributing to lessening your movie experience. But, since we're out of time for today, I think I'll tell you a few of those next week. Last week, we talked about how screwed up arcane Hollywood business stuff was ruining the Academy Awards. Now, since I've not quite cleansed all that particular bile out of my system, let's talk about how screwed up arcane Hollywood business stuff is ruining everything else. Now, if you obsessively follow everything I post throughout the tubes, some of this might sound a little familiar to you. Heck, here's a whole article that touched on some of these themes right here, so if I repeat myself a bit, I apologize, though it does kind of make my point that this stuff still isn't getting fixed. Anyway, the number one problem with the movie business is that Hollywood accounting practices are so shady and fragmented at this point that nobody actually knows how much anything has cost or has earned until way after it's already come and gone. Now, that's good for studio guys looking to cover their asses if something isn't a proper hit, but it's terrible for the medium because it's 
screws up the metrics for measuring success. You can't just say, well, we made a lot of money, because who knows if it was enough money. So instead, everyone fixates on the only solid number that they do have, the box office rankings for their bragging rights, which is disastrous because it makes a film that opens in first place but is so bloated and expensive that that opening barely makes enough to cover its catering budget look like a hit, while a modestly budgeted film that opens in second or third place and stays there for months on end and makes an actual profit looks like a failure. Here's another one. The movie industry and everyone else really needs to stop misusing the term independent as a marketing hook. Let me explain something here. Independent film is not a nickname for good movies that don't cost a lot of money. It actually means something, or at least it used to. See, back in the old days, all of the quote-unquote Hollywood productions were overseen by corporate entities called studios who invested the money used to make the movie. Thusly, any movie produced outside the studios, i.e. the money was coming from some other source, was considered to be independent of those studios, hence an independent film. Eventually, the term even came to be applied to entire small studios established outside side of the original Big Five. Thusly, for most of movie history, the term independent was really just a synonym for cheap. Low-budget monster movies in the 50s, pre-porno nudie movies in the 60s, exploitation in the 70s, schlock horror and cut-rate action in the 80s, etc. But in the 90s, something changed. See, as more and more of Hollywood's year-long business plan turned to focus on the lucrative blockbuster genre offerings, filmmakers looking to put together the kind of modestly budgeted adult dramas that used to be the staple of pre-blockbuster Hollywood's output found they were more likely to get said works produced on the independent scene. This newer, classier breed of indie cinema became the toast of film festivals like Sundance, and soon enough, every major studio had set up indie subdivisions dedicated to farming this new crop of talent. So today, independent film has pretty much been drained of all meaning and relegated to just being the replacement terminology for studio-backed art house productions. Oh, and speaking of those blockbusters taking up the other end of the spectrum, you know what else that no one knows how much money this crap is actually worth problem causes to happen? Adam Sandler starring in Candyland the movie. Yeah, that's a real thing that's being made. You know why? Because movie executives are greenlighting every single name brand product, toy, game, mascot, etc. that they can because everyone is terrified to make a movie that's not supposedly based on some pre-existing thing. Why is that? Well, think about it. When an industry voluntarily obscures the reality of what actually turns a profit and what doesn't, the people in that industry lose their ability to accurately gauge what's going to be popular and what isn't. And that scares the hell out of studio producers, because they're the guys who get in trouble when a movie they greenlit the funding for bombs. So, let's say you're a producer whose movie just tanked at the box office, and the Monday after, because again, the only thing they care about is who came in number one over the weekend, you get called before your investors to explain yourself, and you say... Well, sirs, I thought it was a good idea for a movie, and I made a judgment call to make it. The investors are going to say, well, your judgment sucks, and you're fired. But, if you were to go before those same investors under the same circumstances, but your explanation was, well, gosh, sirs, I honestly don't know what happened. You saw all the same charts and graphs and sales data I did, and it clearly showed that Twinkie the Kid has huge awareness with key demographics, and those snack cakes are really popular. So logically, Twinkie the Kid the movie should have been just as popular, right? I mean, I don't know what happened. There's a decent chance they're going to go, huh. Yeah, we really can't blame you. The numbers all lined up. Don't know what happened. Ass covered, job secured. And nothing was harmed except for the psychological well-being of billions of movie-going audiences worldwide. Ah. Now, do I have any solutions for any of this? Of course not. But thanks for letting me vent about it. And hey, maybe you learned something too. In any case, that's it for the movie stuff for a little while. Next week, we'll talk about whatever I want to. Tune in and find out what that is. I'm Bob, and that's the big picture. <laughs>